Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. Thank you for joining us again uh, at Sydney Prosthodontic Group uh, webinar. Uh, so as always, uh, um, joining me tonight are my, uh, my colleagues, uh, starting from uh, my left here, Dr. Agnes Lai. Hello. Uh, Dr. Zoe Poultras. Hello. And Dr. Johnson Cho. Hi, everyone. So tonight, of course, we'll be delivering um, another round of a webinar uh, with the title of Improving Occlusal Management. Uh, firstly, we want to uh, thank you, our referring dentist, to make this happen. And we deeply appreciate and um, uh, respect your every single referral that you've been uh, sending to us. And all, of course, your trust in us to look after your patients, which we do not take that responsibility uh, lightly. Um, as always, uh, as you know, that tonight's uh, webinar is live and inter interactive, which means that you can uh, send in your questions and I make sure that this is actually working. Um, to receive your CBD certificate, please do not forget that you do have to scroll towards the bottom of your screen to fill in your uh, email uh, uh, address uh, in that uh, webinar bit at the bottom. So please don't forget to do that. And I'll remind you guys again uh, as we go on uh, this evening. Uh, given that we're in a very special period of time, um, just a couple of disclaimers. Uh, number one, that all uh, presenters here um, are COVID negative, uh, being tested recently, uh, and everyone here in this room are, are double vaxxed, uh, including uh, Mr. Brett, Brett Taylor, uh, who is the only IT person here on set who is uh, staying quite far away from us. Um, Furthermore, of course, um, all presentation or information presented this evening are of the opinion of the presenters, so please use this information to your discretion. Tonight's webinar is not possible uh, without our sponsors, um, our uh, long-term sponsor, Noble Biocare. Of course, as you, uh, as, as you guys all, all know, that Noble Biocare has been um, sponsoring me and, uh, of course, the entire team in terms of continued education uh, for many, many years. Um, do look out for their latest uh, in one implant system, which will be uh, made available, I'm guessing, sometime in the next year. A very exciting uh, implant shape, um, and so therefore it's a, as a new surgical and restorative uh, protocol, which I think will benefit uh, a lot of our patients. Credible, uh, you guys all know Sandy and Teresa from Credible. Now is perhaps the best time more than ever uh, to secure that loan given that uh, low interest rate that we have. Uh, Kerr, uh, restorative uh, material has been along, uh, around for a long, long time, particularly with their bonding system. I think there's a particular bond for any uh, generation that you're looking for. So very good range um, uh, applications. Uh, and last but not, not the least, uh, Experian Insurance Services. Uh, for any of you that's looking for uh, TPD or critical illness cover and that haven't had that yet, uh, now is the best time to look for it because the, uh, the policies are still very lenient, uh, which might not be the case anymore. Um, so for any reviews that you may need, um, uh, Mr. Mark Sachs is the man to talk to. So he certainly has helped me personally reviewing my policies and has made a big difference. And for the ones that's joining us for the first time, just a little bit uh, about ourselves. Uh, our Sydney Prosthodontic Group uh, is a prosthodontic specialist practice uh, offering uh, your patients a full range of surgical and restorative services. Um, me and the team, we've been sharing what we learned as a result of your referrals for the, uh, for the past 10 years uh, delivering CPD. And it's just one of our um, aims uh, at SVG where we are aiming to build relationships for the long term, whether it's to help out your patients or help uh, yourself, that's what we're here for. So if you do have any other, uh, ever any uh, concerns or questions um, in whatever capacity, um, I'm sure someone um, at the uh, the team are, are at your service and be able to uh, help out uh, in every any shape that uh, that you see fit. So without any further ado, we're going to get on with uh, tonight's topic of uh, improving um, um, occlusal management. Uh, as we all know that uh, dental occlusion is something that can affect the health of the entire masticatory system, whether it's uh, the teeth, the muscles, the joint, the disc, basically the whole lot. And anytime that we are restoring teeth, moving teeth, or reshaping teeth, we are effectively changing the occlusion. 
However, there's still quite a number of controversies that still exist, whether um, we're talking about what is even perhaps the ideal occlusion or what is a therapeutic occlusion is there's still many different doctrines are at play. And that's what tonight's um, webinar is all about, is we're gonna explore all the different uh, concepts and aspects of occlusion. Um, again, in the uh, very limited time that we're gonna have tonight, we're trying to cover a very broad uh, uh, range of topics to in attempt to demystify occlusion. So we're gonna, given that occlusion has been around for a decade or two, um, I thought it would be interesting to cover a little bit of the history uh, of occlusion. How did we get to where we are today? So Agnes, if you don't mind, um, could you take us, take us through first about some, some, some histories on occlusion and, and, and where perhaps some of those doctrines historically came from? Great, thank you, Ben. Um, so first of all, I think uh, laying down our foundation of our knowledge on occlusion, we learn about the history and evolution of um, the way of thought um, in this discipline is uh, quite critical. Um, because, you know, in the end of the day, many of us are interested in occlusion because it just seems to have all these uh, mysteries or theories or philosophies and um, it's almost like you know you have to choose your team what what school of thought do you belong to and um, and I think there has been a lot of confusion where um, in terms of uh, not just studying occlusion as a, a, a as a mode of discipline in itself but almost um, having an occlusively driven type of treatment plan where um, having ideal occlusion is the mode of treatment um, in, in some instances has really bring about um, a, a lot of confusion in the field. So let's take a, a very um, step back um, and let's see if we can unfold this to, to the core of uh, what really should we care about as clinicians in terms of when it comes to occlusion. So, you know, we have an interest to study something um, to mainly have an understanding and to appreciate the topic. And that's, of course, very true. It's ke what keeps things interesting. But as clinician, we are very interested in occlusion because um, one, uh, it is mainly the functional occlusion that if we see patients uh, who still have teeth, a dentate patient, we want to ensure that um, you know, their, their, the way their teeth come together as smooth and is in a functional order, no um, disorder in the TM, um, but also like, you know, that our prosthesis will last without any complications, uh, especially in a mechanical way. And um, in the functional occlusion in the edentate, so patients coming to see us without their teeth, um, then it's a real challenge. And uh, being able to manage the occlusal scheme uh, plays a large part in their adaptability and the prosthesis stability. And finally, of course, uh, learning occlusal principle is uh, almost uh, uh, a prerequisite if anyone were to have any interest in doing any form of a full mouth oral rehabilitation when it comes to reorganizing um, the occlusion, forming a stable jaw record, or having any predictable uh, adaptation uh, throughout that rehabilitation. So, you know, what comes into play in occlusion is, of course we know that that's how teeth comes together. And on the right hand side, you can see a, a very classic um, nathology type of uh, trapezoidization in molars and uh, having n numerous contact evenly across the arch. And very much so, it, it had been the emphasis of um, occlusion uh, many, many years ago, uh, beginning in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. But what we then also know is the teeth don't just come together by themselves. Um, magically, the teeth are housed in the alveolars and there is movement of the mandible. And to coordinate this movement is, of course, muscles and, um, and the nervous system that gives the sensory input and the motor control that brings about the jaw movements. And hence, you can see that if we were to have a look at the um, unfolding of the study in occlusion, um, at the very beginning of what has been documented, uh, it is the early, um, typical of the early sciences, where when we study something, we start by observations and we start by describing 
all the different classifications that we see. And hence, in the late 1800s, as early as like, you know, your angles classification, which is used a lot, and we know, we're quite familiar with them um, in orthodontics. And, and these classification mainly are descriptors, um, just describing the form and shape of how the teeth in the digitates. Now, in the early 1900s, McCullum was the, um, basically the father of nephrology. And um, further on uh, identifying this um, uh, presentation of how teeth comes together, uh, there were also introduction of a lot of the mathematical model. Um, so for example, the bone wheel triangle, which is a, a equilateral triangle having uh, the side uh, between the intercondylar distance should be equal um, to the point you draw of, of the lower incisal edge. Um, having a, the spherical model with the Schuller and uh, Pankerman type, like, you know, uh, uh, movements. So a, a lot of this principle comes from what people up start to apply to think it's ideal is in many way not too dissimilar to, for example, in aesthetics, like, you know, we, we very well accepted that oh, there are golden proportions, um, there are specific way that we know they are principles. It doesn't mean that everyone have to be made that way, no. um, but it certainly would seem nice and smooth and functional if they were to be described as such. So, you know, um, but this is how science has evolved and it's not to deem any right or wrong, but certainly back in the old days, there was a time where people believed that they have to engineer or modify teeth in a certain way uh, in order to prevent disease or wear of teeth or et cetera, et cetera. But we have very much moved away from that because we now know that um, very much, for example, just even uh, later on as uh, Zoe will talk to us um, about how to capture a centric relation records, etc. that even centric relations throughout this time of definition has moved itself away from being a single point to more of um, a, an accepted zone uh, that the, the condyle would uh, be in and that it is able to just rotate smoothly and function nicely within that zone that the uh, person can adapt. And more and more so, instead of um, having uh, a, a, a particular regimented way of uh, operated guided determination, it is more patient-centered, stress-free, more described in a physiological way. So how do we uh, move away from uh, traditional nephrology concepts uh, to what we know of today. And it's very important here that I want to bring about is it's still important to understand where these structural concepts come from, not to write it off completely, but to understand that it doesn't really cause disease per se, but it still very much have an impact on how we design our processes or when it comes to how we apply this knowledge to understand where the chronic presentation of our patient presenting uh, has come from. So in this particular slide here, you can see on the far left, I have drawn uh, the uh, anterior plane of the condyle um, against the eminence and uh, you can, it's basically a duplicate, so they're of the same angle. And if you can imagine, that would be the protrusive, excursive path of the patient's anterior relationship. And it is theorized that if there is no other muscles or everything else controlled, the skeleton is as it is. That of course, when you, um, you know, move the mandible forward in a protrusive movement, then there would be a bit more balanced pressure on both the teeth and the condyle. However, if the functional angle at the teeth is going to be more steep than the condylar eminence protrusive path, then of course, when the person uh, protrudes its jaw, more force will be applied on the teeth in terms of feeling a little bit more trapped at the jaw in the condylar level, or if our teeth 
were the ones taking the low, it is going to have more lateral or bending moments about the teeth or our restoration. And this is what we typically see in cases where people have a very steep functional angle. Um, it's more, they're more prone to cracks. They're more prone to having lateral loads. Now, if we, the um, patient on the other side presents in a very class three or very um, you know, flat sort of functional angle, then um, it is theorized then the jaw will have to take more of the load. But in the end of the day, how does it matter to our day-to-day -day clinical dentistry? And of course, people don't come in as a diagram. And of course, they don't just have the front teeth, they have other teeth. So the number of units does play a role. The muscles and ligaments do take a role as well, um, because it's not just the structures. The time frame of how things occur plays a role, whether the tooth wear occurs over time, uh, whether there's passive eruption as the tooth wears, the jaw joint can remodel. So time, in fact, plays a big factor to how our human body will respond to these presenting situations. And that is why uh, often we, we do see people in uh, presenting in different ways. They don't all have the same problem. And so what you will find is that how even it's been described in the prosthodontic setting, how we used to capture uh, jaw joint record with the nathology of using central bearing pins, uh, having patient feedback, drawing that crow's feet with the movement so that where they cross over is the centric relation to later on more operated guidance, uh, so that uh, the lower left picture is a picture by Dawson Academy of how they will uh, rotate and seat the condyle into, and manipulate the condyle into what's supposedly the most superior anterior position in the ideal anatomically braced condylar disc eminence relationship. Uh, or the use of Lucia jig or later on leaf gauge in a more loose way of like, you know, just a half clench hold to um, more of having the patient's physiology in mind uh, where, you know, uh, we, we take into this account um, so that we are able to uh, work out just what is the zone that the patient's jaw is comfortable in. And here you can see that once you layer the muscles over the jaw joint, there is that fracture of control. It's no longer just a rotational path, very much bended angle and movement. And we know that as the patient going the full clench, the whole mandible can sit a bit further. Depending on the ligament laxity, even within our teeth, you know, the physiological sign of overloading could be frematous. Uh, when we typical, more typical in molars where it's multi-rooted, um, and therefore the, it is a bit more grounded in to the alveolus. And if the tooth structure can't take the load, they can present as crack. So whether um, any signs of overloading, the patient may present anywhere from tooth wear, frematous, crack teeth, fracture restorations, or TMD um, with uh, musculoskeletal pain, like you know arthritic erosiveness of the joint, all of these are, are different uh, presenting mode and each individual can be different. So there, in this timeline, people begin to realize, oh, it's not just teeth, it's not just the structure, it's not just the joint. And certainly there is this um, emergence of looking at muscles. Well, what if we just relax all the muscles into the ideal muscle length position and consider that as your vertical dimension of rest and then back calculate where that ideal vertical occlusion should be and rework the, reorganize the jaw that way. You know, so these concepts have been explored, but um, you know, one of the downside of necessarily doing every case this way by default is that, as Johnson will take you through later on, is that a lot of the times you end up probably on, on the border of, of that zone and, um, and end up in a way that binds the patient to a lot more units of treatment than otherwise need because you are in, in a bit more far open rather than uh, minimal opening necessarily. 
So throughout this timeline, it doesn't stop at really Dawson. Um, we, you, there are many clinicians out there now who like, you know, adopt a more panky man, shuler type of um, asking the jo patient to do a more habitual up closure with the tongue to the roof of their mouth and just chin guide um, to more like a shawl technique of using leaf gauge. All these different uh, modalities will be explored. But conceptually, it's identifying um, the, the differences and understanding that there is a propensity in our patient to be able to adapt um, you know, to different types of occlusion so long as these changes are made over time. Um, and if it is made suddenly, what are the clinical key points we will take into account of um, to, to be able to ensure that uh, or, or be able to assist our patient in adaptation. And coming to this point, we discover that, you know, traditionally there seemed to be this ideal occlusion that has been afford described with tripodization, how many units of contact throughout the arch. But, um, you know, or, or whether everyone comes in has to be a class one of only a particular type of overbite or overjet. Um, but indeed, we are seeing more and more uh, people in many different studies that present malocclusion in different ways that are fully satisfied and fully functional. So it is from here that, you know, as clinician, we discover that it is not so much an ideal occlusion uh, that has to be uh, dictated and, and abide by or follow through, but understanding the principle um, that we just want something that's therapeutic. And um, Bayron has described therapeutic occlusion very well actually since 1950s. And if we look at the basic um, five principle of how he describes uh, what is therapeutic occlusion, it actually uh, is able to distinguish itself, not committing to uh, particularly only looking at teeth or looking at joint or looking at the nerves or looking at the muscles, um, but just a smooth functional and coordination um, of these movements. So he describes that um, you, you basically just need a maximum number of bilateral centric um, contacts during closing and maximum intercuspation, regardless of whether you're in class one, class two, or class three. And also later on, it's, um, you know, uh, Wiscard and Belsers already identified also in the, in the late 90s that um, instead of needing uh, three points per tooth, uh, you really just need the minimum one point per tooth uh, on the occluding pairs to provide the inter and intra arch stability as well as uh, not having any higher risk of, of any functional issues. And as prosthodontists, you would apply this concept to maximally, no matter how the tooth present, is to direct that occlusal load um, axially, uh, reduce any bending moment on that, um, on that load to look after the tooth or the restoration uh, that you have in principle. And so that is actually Bayron's second point is as far as possible axial loading of the posterior teeth for optimal force distribution within the alveolus. And so when we are applying this occlusal concept, we got to, we, there is flexibility to also be mindful of how we design our restoration or our prosthesis to improve its retention and resistance form and to safeguard from, if it's a natural tooth, any bending moments. And this is essentially how, um, you know, there's emergence of even with implant uh, loading is to have a smaller occlusal table. Um, this more favorably loads the implant fixture for one, but having that flatter occlusal plane, it all fits in well with the therapeutic occlusal design. And having that flatter occlusal plane is also what is being described as having that freedom in Bayron's uh, identification, he is, he's more specific to having the freedom of retrusive range of movement in the third point because he wrote this at a time where um, there was a popular school for to keep taking a retruded position. We, many of us have heard a retruded position uh, in our jaw record taking. 
And the danger of a lot of the times of taking a retreated position, not so much that it's not within the zone, um, it is very much at the border of the zone. And particularly if you're not um, working with a physician who uh, is highly skilled, then it's very technique sensitive. And this is what he is precisely saying, that you have to be able to build in that range of freedom. So in, ca in cases or instances where people tend to employ technique of taking CR record at a more border movement, and it is important to calculate this long centric so that it still allows that freedom of jaw movement after your, your functional design. And in fact, point four, we'll have a look at this uh, freedom, not just in an anterior posterior way, but very much on a lateral movements as well. And this lateral movement is also in keeping with um, having less bending moment individually on this tooth, because now we're looking at the buccal palatal plane um, of individual teeth. Uh, which is usually the the uh, bruxing directions as well. So, and number five of Baron's therapeutic occlusion is to recognize time. So uh, basically, depending on uh, how uh, people wear their teeth, and this base it is basically summarizes that as people um, lose their uh, have any tooth wear. Um, situation, there are different scenarios whereby they may uh, have uh, restorative space, um, lose vertical dimension, but a lot of the times they don't actually lose vertical dimension, there could be passive eruption. Now uh, this impact on the, how the condylar function, depending on uh, how much of that rotational closure to the point of occlusion, uh, and if there's any abrupt changes here uh, without the the jaw joint being able to remodel um, accordingly, then there could be that disruption if it were to be sudden. So at this point, um, we will pass to Zoe to talk about. Before we head on to Zoe, <coughs> Agnes, I think it's uh, you did a terrific job in covering the history of, of occlusion. Um, start off by saying that um, our understanding of occlusion is that how teeth is basically little bits of bumps meets together. And then later on, it's the, uh, it's, it's the jaw position or the disc condyl, condyl to disc relationship position. Mm -hmm. And then later on, that moved to uh, perhaps how the muscles should work. And now we're at a point where we're really looking at more freedom and flexibility. Mm -hmm. So um, how would you say the, the, the main difference between ideal mm -hmm. occlusion and versus a therapeutic occlusion, what would you say would the main differences be? I think uh, people develop ideal occlusion in their mind is still based on form, mm. very much based on form and uh, there, there, what... There's a specific end goal in mind, doesn't it? It That's has to right. be that. So, you know, even back in the days of angles classification, uh, there, there is class one occlusion, class one mal occlusion, uh, class two occlusion, class two mal occlusion, but, you know, somewhere in the, all of us, deep in our hearts, we all favor class one. It's like almost class two and class three are already my occlusion. Yes. Right? So uh, a, a lot of the times these ideal is not, it's, it's quite subjective and it is based on form. So, um, but what therapeutic occlusion targets is um, the ability to just function smoothly um, and stable and the patient's well adapted to, to their speech and, uh, and chewing movements. And, um, and also there is no uh, interruptions, uh, whether it's to their natural teeth or challenges to our prosthesis. Um, it, it's just to be able to allow not only the freedom, but also the smooth functional movement um, of, of all the structures that are involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Could you also give us uh, a little bit of uh, information on occlusion and temporal mandibular disorder or TMD. Mm -hmm. That's been a topic that um, has been um, really proposed a lot right over the last 50 years. And I think there is a, some very good compelling evidence out now in, in, a, in even a systematic literature review form to, yes. to debate that. Could you, could you share some light uh, with us on that topic? Very much so. Um, I, do, I do think that um, 
a, a very brief summary of what we have on the literature now um, in systematic review and so forth. Um, it, it, it does hit the nail on the head in that I do not think occlusion in itself has any causal relationship to TMD. And you, you, you can extract that <laughs> and say, <laughs> uh -oh. That. oh, here comes trouble. But um, however, it is very important um, to understand that uh, sometimes, and, and as I have now described to you, uh, a, a therapeutic occlusion requires all the elements coming together well. Okay? So when the system, uh, when everything is sort of on par and able to adjust and adapt, it will not kick, some, kick it off the wheel. Mm. Right? But in certain scenario where you have a sudden occlusal change, and there is also perhaps um, some limitation on the patient to be able to adapt. Whether this be a muscle, mus like, you know, musculoskeletal weakness, whether this may be, um, you know, there is a compromise already in the periodontal ligaments, whether this may be that there's already a, a crack in the tooth that presents. Or parafunction. You know? So, you know, I'm, I am really trying to be very frank here and to identify that, and I, and I had in my previous slide, it is really not just the muscle mm. and it's not just the joint. There is the coordination uh, with the neuromuscular movements. Um, there is very much neuroplasticity that can be involved. And that is why often when these changes occur over time, and many of times are challenged, like you know, in the orthodontic treatment, they destabilize the jaw from get go. So why don't we see more commonly patients going through all four have TMD? And why are we so uptight when there is TMD in a patient and that yet they want to go through all four? How are we able to encounter or or, or assist that? Um, and it's it's being able to to have that understanding. Um, of, of what could trigger when mm. and, and why. So, um, so there, there could be some occlusal concepts that very much will help us manage our TMD patients, mm. uh, including understanding how the therapeutic occlusal scheme works mm. and, and why perhaps Michigan Splint help in that way. Um, but, you know, but it does not in itself mm. present by default be a have any causal relationship to TMD. And when you diagnose someone with uh, particular types of TMD, TMD is a very broad umbrella, but even if you're able to uh, diagnose someone with a TM condition, um, it does not, well, I, I do not feel that um, doing uh, any occlusally driven prosthodontics uh, would be the key to manage it. Um, th the condition should be managed first, mm. Uh, having that therapeutic concept in mind, which I know later on um, Zoe has some nice cases to show us. Uh, and then, of course, we carry these occlusal principles when we design our future rehabilitation. So let's get on with it and share these cases with us. Now, just before we, we, we do that, there is a, there is a question. <laughs> you're, you're almost stealing my job tonight, Agnes, uh, of, of moderating. Now, there is a question from the audience. Uh, is one of the reasons a Michigan splint can reduce TND symptoms that it induces a flat occlusal plane? I think very much so. In, you, you, can, you can say that it, that is a big point in that not only does it have a flat occlusal plane um, in, in, in that um, the idea is to almost like an ice skating field, giving the jaw the complete degree of freedom, but it has to have that sta stability. Uh, in, in that centric zone, uh, so that when the jaw closes, uh, it has to have the bilateral even contacts, um, more or less symmetrical contacts, um, and, and to have offer that jaw that stability. And then from there, uh, having that uh, flat plane, really it's like an ice skating field for the, for the jaw joint um, with least resistance and allow it to just heal and move. So to catch on further on that topic, uh, we do have a, another uh, previous webinar, which is on the topic of uh, management of uh, TMD, uh, which we have covered um, that as well as our occlusal splint design principles as well. So feel free to check out that webinar um, on our website.
So uh, thank you for all the, all the listeners and participants tonight uh, sending in questions and uh, keep on uh, continue to do so. I'll do my very best to forward your questions to our panel. So moving on, um, Agnes previous has uh, mentioned a couple of times a centric relation, how historically uh, that, that relationship is a very much a forced uh, position, which over the years that has, has changed. And I believe that um, in, in, in the prosthodontic manual that we have, there's something like six different definitions uh, or versions of what a centric relation is, uh, is now. So Zoe, do you mind take us through what on earth is a centric relation? <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Of course. Um, so centric relation is, um, is uh, related uh, to a physiological position of the condyle and the glenoid fossa. Um, it is completely independent of tooth contact. Now, um, we do determine centric relation um, clinically. Um, so it's a procedure that we do to record the jaw relationship. And it has been um, from anatomical studies. We know that the condyle, in terms of the relation to the glenoid fossa, it is located in the uppermost an anterior most position. Now, um, it is um, the most protruded position of the mandible physiologically to the maxilla. Now, centric relation is important because it's uh, stable and it's reproducible. A lot of cases we have uh, patients who may not have an, a stable occlusal contact, uh, who might have lost a lot of teeth, and they need some sort of, uh, uh, we need to, to be able to record that in a reproducible manner um, for us to give them a occlusal rehabilitation. So if we draw a line, um, a horizontal line between um, the excesses of the condyle, and that is a transverse horizontal axis. So it's a centric relation is actually a pure rotary movement about that transverse horizontal axis. So the muscle are thought to be um, the most relaxed and unstrained, and we need to have the patients quite relaxed. So it's quite difficult actually sometimes um, to record that centric relation because most of our patients are tense in the dental chair. They, they have their jaws quite tight and, and you need to get them to a stage where they're really comfortable and relaxed. Um, and also people who might have pain, uh, whether it's uh, related to the arrangement of the TMJ, it's Im almost impossible to record that. So management of this um, first before we take the centric relation. So how do we do it? Um, Agnes uh, previously mentioned uh, Dawson's technique. Uh, so Dawson recommended a bimanual manipulation where you have to sit the patient in a supine position, um, get them to relax. Um, so position your hands bilaterally, um, the four fingers around the, um, just under the angle of the mandible on both sides and the thumbs are in front of the chin bilaterally. Um, ask the patient to relax their jaw so that you can actually move the jaw around that rotational movement. Um, so you're rotating the condyles as opposed to forcing that condyle. So it's got to be gentle in a way that you're not pressuring or forcing the, the mandible back that is, might be uncomfortable. Once you get the patient to really uh, relax um, and you're able to reproducibly uh, mimic that movement of rotation, um, we, it's time to start recording that, um, that movement and record the, uh, the point where tooth, um, uh, the recording of the teeth. So what we do, we can either use a, a uh, cold cure acrylic um, as a jig to act on the anterior teeth, or you can use a light cure acrylic like a triad uh, gel. So you, you paste, so you mix, uh, put that on the central incisors, maxillary incisors, and as you rotating um, that mandible into a closing position before you achieve tooth contact. So always leave a millimeter to a millimeter of and a half of space between the maxillary and mandibular um, teeth. Um, then the indentation of, uh, of the mandibular incisors on the, on the triad base. We can light cure that uh, base so we can um, actually have the indentation of the teeth on the base and then ensure that you've got the right recording. So as the, you move the mandible out again, so open uh, along that translation, uh, rotational movement um, and ensure that you've actually recorded that movement correctly. Um, once we're happy with our jig, uh, record, then we can um, just register the posterior occlusion um, using a PVS, um, PVS material of, of your choice. Um, and that is it. So that's the recording of the centric relation. So the controversies, um, there has been a lot um, in the past and it's 
purely relating to the position of the condyle in relation to the glenophosa. I've mentioned that uh, from anatomical studies, we know that it's in the uppermost and foremost uh, position. However, um, other clinicians did believe that it's related to the uppermost and midmost position, um, and others uh, preferred to it to being in the uppermost and rearmost position. So that has been a position or a, a certain view that's been debated um, uh, over many years. Um, clinically relevant uh, centriculation is really important uh, because um, we mentioned earlier it's, um, it's a stable reproducible position where you can um, capture uh, the jaw relationship. So this position is independent of tooth contact, it's physiological. So what we're having is patients who actually uh, partially dentate or they might have over eruption of teeth um, you can see sometimes when they close, they might, or they might, um, there might be a shift um, or that's guided by the tooth contact. So once there's tooth contact, we don't know how accurate um, their jaw position. So it may not be at the most relaxed uh, position. It might be at a forced position um, or habitual position. So we really need to um, have a baseline where we're comfortable. Um, that this is the, the recording that we, we need to, to, to carry out our uh, future pr uh, prosthesis. So we use it for full dentures where there's really no teeth um, to act as a reference or guide. Um, we use it for uh, long span bridges where there's um, no posterior contacts that we can relate to and for full mouth reconstructions or patient who might come and say my bite is really uncomfortable I don't know what causing things or restorations that fracturing for one particular reason uh, or another and, and we don't know what's causing it. So recording a centric relation may help us or give us a clues to see what might be causing the problem in that patient occlusion. So this is a case. Um, it's, a, it's a case I'd like to share with you uh, for a patient who's, uh, who had uh, have uh, amelogenesis imperfecta, and uh, he was rehabilitated in the past with a eyeglass uh, crowns um, that have worn over a number of years. So he his he wasn't happy with the way his uh, teeth are like in, in aesthetically, and he wasn't um, comfortable in, in uh, his chewing. There's a lot of sensitivity um, from the exposed. Uh, like, like from the subsequent root recession, uh, gingival recession exposing the root surfaces, as well as um, you can see there's a really shallow incisal guidance, um, actually really not incisal guidance, they're mainly a posterior um, sort of guidant occlusion or interferences. So with this case, um, to be able to, um, this, because we don't have any references really, so once you've recorded um, or verify uh, the occlusal vertical dimension, and, and later on Johnson will take us on what, how, how can we record the occlusal vertical dimension. So once we're happy with the incisal um, edge position and we're happy that the patient's OVD is at the optimal OVD, um, then um, using that centric jig, that, uh, that anterior jig that I've um, uh, mentioned to you previously, uh, we can record the anterior contact um, and then um, we uh, using a PVS uh, paste um, ensuring that the posterior contact. So when, when we get the final restorations, um, the aim is we have minimal occlusal adjustment. So if our occlusal record or documentation um, that we send to the, uh, to the ceramist uh, is as accurate as we can, it means that when we get the restorations back, there will be a minimal uh, need for occlusal adjustment and uh, less time in the chair that you can certainly spend on cementing and trialing other factors of these restoration rather than occlusal adjustment. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful case there. Um, so one of the, the viewers has asked when you record the centric relation, um, you had that try it pace there as an mm -hmm. anterior stop essentially. Could you actually use a leaf gauge instead? Um, so the leaf gauge you can, I think Johnson will speak to that, uh, talk about that later on in recording the, um, it, the, the, having the leaf gauge was actually opening the bite um, anteriorly. So, so you s can capture that. So leaf gauge is one of the record, uh, methods of recording uh, centric relation as well. Um, but what I did in this case is I wanted to have an exact OVD. So I didn't want to play mm. with opening the pin on an, on an articulator later on. So once we 
able to capture that at the exact OVD, then everything else should have some sort of accuracy or uh, as good accurate as uh, record as possible. I agree. Um, with the leaf gauge, there is a, a, um, an area of there might be some occlusal error. As we know, ov opening the OVD by more than 10 mil millimeters on the articulator will create some occlusal error on introduced source errors. And I think in particular with how this question has been asked, can a leaf gauge be used to achieve centrifugation instead of by manual technique? I think in, in, the, in the short answer is yes. Um, in fact, the, you, t throughout tonight's presentation is that we will be going through different methods of capturing CR and, and it goes back to the whole notion of how I set the tone at the beginning is that, um, you know, instead of rather than going to uh, just one philosophy and, and uh, uh, taking it as a default or some kind of doctrine, it's very important to understand where those philosophy comes from and to be then able to select patients where uh, perhaps certain technique have some merit. Um, but certainly uh, we, as, as operators here, we all have our preferred default method that we feel as an individual uh, make the patient most at ease so that uh, you know, if they're not otherwise presented with uh, any particular issue, uh, that would be our individual method uh, that is a go-to. Um, but over tonight's course of presentation, you will be able to see uh, CR taken in different ways. Um, and even leaf gauge alone, um, there is a traditional documented way to use leaf gauge as well as just a modified way to use the leaf gauge. Um, but the concept is quite different in technique. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think one of the dangers of using leaf gauge is, is that you're more likely uh, to retrude the, the, uh, retrude the mandible. So you do have to be cautious of how you use the leaf gauge. You know how dentistry is so operator dependent, and so technique sensitive, so using one tool um, when you give it to 10 different operators, you may get completely different different outcomes. So um, so I, I agree with the, everything what Agnes said is that, well, you can, but you have to be very cautious of how you use that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the, the techniques that um, Zoe has demonstrated is that there is not only a, uh, a uh, there's, there, there's no contact on the teeth, but also there is a positive vertical stop. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when, uh, it's almost like this is sort of like a long centric thing going on. It's a little platform. So the patient could bite freely on that platform and there's nothing to force the patient's jaw backwards, um, even if the patient bit a little bit harder. So that's why I think it's just easier perhaps mm -hmm. to get a much more accurate um, position. That, and, that's all. And I loved how the way you then resin tag the edge to be able to relocate precisely that's the um, anterior stop point. Yes. Just for the capturing of the MMR, not to necessarily think that some may easily interpret that, oh, that's locking it into one position. Well, only for the time of us taking the record so that the record is reproducible and precise. So there is a difference um, in, in understanding those, mm -hmm. uh, whether we're doing it for rehabilitation purpose or whether that's part of uh, perhaps what some others have in mind, jumping ahead, and I'm not trying to assume, but it's easy to, <laughs> um, that they are doing a, a record for particular type of splint or et cetera, et cetera. Trying to uh, continue watching our webinar differentiating that the fact that tonight's webinar is not tying occlusion with TMD alone, but we're looking at it as a therapeutic occlusion concept uh, with prosthodontics. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. There's another really, really good question that says, if, if they can't record that CR at that appointment, mm -hmm. I assume you know, there could be a couple of clinical possibilities, could be with, with TMD or muscular issues where that occlusion is not stable. How would you go about arranging that and one of the, the questions there is that do you would you use the deep programmer mm -hmm. for say four weeks so, um, so Lucia Jake I think uh, Agnes mm -hmm. have mentioned that as well so you could we could use that to, to try to deprogram the jaw so taking away um, not just the tooth contact but the 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 sort of relaxing the muscles as well um, another way that uh, and I'll show you in a case later on um, what I've done is um, a, a an Overdenture um, appliances, yes. or an extra oral appliance that the patient could go away, and there's really no interferences. There's a flat occlusal plane that, it's that they can. It's an occlusal splint. It's an occlusal splint, Essential. almost. Yeah, and and that will help as as well into deprogramming the the patient. 
Terrific. Um, so, um, so of course, centric relation is one very common uh, position that mm -hmm. we take, and there's a number of other ways That's that you can it. take relationship as well. Could you mm -hmm. go through with us maybe it's what it's these different different ways of, of doing it and when perhaps is one relationship maybe more suitable sure. for, for those situations? Sure. So other ways of, um, of recording is uh, we've got retreated contact position. So this is um, a, a, also a guided occlusion relationship um, and it is the most retreated position of the condyle in the joint cavity. Um, it is re reported to be more retreated than actually centric relation. I don't normally use the retreated contact position. Um, it is more like a, a forced position, um, dis more distally forced position of the, of the mandible. The other common one that we actually use is ICP, so intercuspal um, position. Um, it is relating to the intercuspation of the teeth. So it is actually the, the way, it's referred to the way the teeth are best fit together. Um, uh, it's independent of con condylar position. Now, that recording is used for um, when you're so doing a single tooth crown or individual crowns um, or when the patient um, conforming to the patient occlusion. So we're happy with the OVD, we're happy with the tooth contact, we're only doing segments at a time. Um, so ICP is a way um, to record that and, and um, it works quite well. Um, centric occlusion, it is actually the it's, it is recorded in centric relation, so it's a little bit confusing. So you're actually taking the record in centric relation, but it is the first tooth contact um, when um, in, in that centric relation. Mm -hmm. So it's still the condyle rotating um, um, in, in the most relaxed position of the muscles, but as the teeth actually approach into contact, then that's a centric occlusion. And you might take that if you, if a patient present with um, like, they come in and they say, I'm, I'm really not comfortable with my bite. Uh, I think something is wrong or, or there's some sort of contact somewhere that when I eat, it's hitting um, prematurely and causing pain and discomfort. So this is something to look for any interferences or any issues in Absolutely. that regard. So how, what's the difference between um, CR and, and CO? So centric relation, again, referring to the uh, physiological position um, of the condyle. Um, it's independent of tooth contact, um, whereas the centric occlusion, it is also um, where the condyle is most physiologically um, comfortable, but it is dependent of tooth contact. So, There's one question here. This is how do you check for difference or the discrepancy? Because often you know, you, you, in textbooks you hear uh, COCR discrepancy. That phrase gets thrown in a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there, how do you clinically check for that? Well, it's not C or CR discrepancy. I, I think it's a CO is where it is it is recording in CR. So you, you're yes. actually getting a premature or some sort of tooth contact. So perhaps not all the teeth are coming together in that CR position. Um, they're usually a discrepancy or a, a, a long centric. So there's a, mm. a, a shift between um, CO and ICP. So there might be a discrepancy there yes. um, where people can have a, a more retreated position and, and you come we sometimes when doing um, record for a denture uh, patient and recorded in CR quite often they have that posturing forward and yes. there's always like they come back and the, the bite is completely mm. different because mm. they more habitually posture forward and they're more comfortable in that because maybe they have recessive chin and and they want to improve the profile or they just more comfortable in that position yes mm. Now, um, Ulf Bossel, in 1952, he described an envelope of motion uh, where there's a, uh, there's a maximum mandibular range of movement. So um, here we have the ICP, so that's the intercuspal position, and he described that the mandible actually, if we're looking at it from a sagittal uh, view, that the mandible will actually move down and forward as it bypasses the incisal edge, so, and then into protrusive movement. Um, and then the rotation and translation. So the, um, he postulated that there's a, in the first 20 millimeters of opening, it's actually a, a rotational movement of the condyle. And then we end up from the R moving into the T where that is a translation. Um, and then that sort of um, 
line up with the protrusive um, opening as well. So th this is um, looking at that possible envelope of motion. If, if we have a look at the diagram um, next to it where the at line, where, where the red zone is, um, if, if we think of how the teeth uh, during chewing mo motion or, or movement, um, this during that chewing movement, the actually mandibular incisors move within that red zone, um, whereas the mandible will have a wider range within that envelope of motion. So this is the case I, I spoke to you about earlier on. Um, this patient, she had a, she, you can see from her facial features, uh, she's quite strained. Um, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, she had um, quite an extensive medical history and, and she wasn't happy about, she didn't present to be happy. They had, she had a, quite a lot of concerns and, and looking at her smile, one of her concerns were definitely her smile. She said, my teeth are worn. Um, there's a, like a, sort of um, a slide or a slant in her um, incisal plane and she was missing a lot of teeth. So her concern, she said, my teeth are worn, bite it dropped and she couldn't smile. She didn't want to smile. And she constantly bite her cheek and, and, um, and uh, tongue. Um, she felt that her jaw was overclosed. She had pain in her jaw, so she couldn't open wide and she couldn't open for a long period of time. From her medical history, she had a lot of medications, a lot of surgery procedures, um, and uh, poor thing, she will sit in the chair and she's got um, kidney attacks um, quite often. So her limitation in, in um, how long she can stay in the chair um, was um, basically 45 minutes um, every appointment. So there was a lot of management uh, for that patient, which maybe started with actually getting a good patient rapport with, the, with her, like establishing trust. Um, that was the major part of her management, uh, more so than, um, than the dental management. Um, so clinically, with the jaw pain that she described, um, with, uh, that my finding was it's related to myofascial pain. Um, so she had um, tenderness uh, almost three out of three uh, in all of the masticatory muscles and the neck muscles as well. Um, her limitation of opening was related to the, to the pain itself as opposed to derangement of the TMJ. So there was no clicking, she had a straight opening path, but the pain limited her um, movement of uh, her mandible. Okay, so looking at uh, uh, intraoral uh, images, you can see this uh, a deep, uh, deep bite, almost 100% um, with a class two relationship. There's a, a limitation of posterior um, or minimal posterior contact or occlusion, um, and she had some sort of wound dentition because of the deep bite as well. Um, Luckily, the teeth all had um, good endodontic, periodontal, and restorative prognosis. And there's a couple of uh, questionable teeth that after investigation, they worked out to be uh, quite good. So with this um, patient management, um, it was really important to establish, um, to, to do the proper diagnosis. So um, mounting her record on a, uh, on a centric relation and doing a diagnostic wax up to, to ensure that uh, which teeth, uh, so the aim was to minimize any uh, management that needed, that's not necessary. So minimize any teeth that needed to be treated. Um, so with the diagnostic wax up, you can work out which teeth actually needs to be uh, managed and uh, discuss then from that um, the treatment options with the patient. So considering that she had a um, difficulty um, sitting in the chair for a prolonged period of time, um, we decided to use a, um, uh, well, first of all, um, because of the TMD, um, I managed her TMD by the, the standard um, conservative approach, which included the home care, um, the exercises, heat application, they had physiotherapy, she had counseling as well. And um, what I did was a stabilizing appliance. Um, so the aim of that appliance, and if, I don't know if it's clear to see, um, it actually covers all the occlusal surfaces. So it covers the palatal surfaces of the incisors, covers the occlusal surfaces of posterior teeth, and replaces her missing teeth. Now, that appliance acted as a like a denture or an overdenture, and she wore pretty much all day long. Um, except for when she needed to brush her teeth, so she slept with it, she wore it during the day. So it acted as a deep program for me because it it's provided two aims. One, it increased the OVD uh, according to my wax up, 
Um, it minimizes the time. So every time she comes in, we might remove a bit of the acrylic of a couple of teeth and then build these two teeth. And that's it. That will be the session end there. Um, and it gave us time to actually assess whether her TMD will resolve. Mm -hmm. um, and that she actually at the one month where she wore the appliance, she had a resolution of her myofascial pain and her opening increased um, to 39 millimeters and she had no pain when she did that. So there's a, a good signs that, okay, this patient is ready to move um, forward with the next phase. Okay, um, so as before, and what I did for her, something very simple, um, basically composite buildups because of the limited time that we had. I do wanna uh, put her through a lot of extensive treatments. So just composite um, buildups to increase the OVD and a, a removable denture. And that was sufficient. She was pretty happy with that. Um, um, follow up uh, show that uh, her teeth were stable and her um, also jaw pain was quite stable as well. So there was no pain. Um, and I did follow up for a number of years. So this is her and you can see from the photo like she's, she looks more relaxed and happier than when she first presented. Terrific. Zoe, so your, your, your case had, uh, of course, this um, increase in OVD, which we'll get on to next. But your previous case that you've shown, which had a quite an extensive um, four miles rehabilitation involving many, many crowns mm -hmm. for that um, amelogenesis imperfecta case. Um, this question, I guess, perhaps could go to the entire panel, which is, I think is a very good question, is, which is when you cement in posterior crowns in these sort of large rehab cases, do you do that in one go or do you do that in stages so that the patient could perhaps get used to their new occlusion or new occlusal scheme? Hmm. Well, um, I actually do that in one go because I've actually, I've, I've, through the temporary phase, provisional phase, you've actually established the OVD, hmm. the established the occlusal scheme and the patient had uh, sometimes even a few months yes. to trial mm -hmm. that occlusion scheme. So mm -hmm. um, when we come to take the definitive impression, they already been happy, comfortable with yes. that. Mm -hmm. and, and the lab basically just copies, That's right. mm -hmm. um, and make it ni nicer and, and, and yes. refine, but copies what we give them. And the big caveat there, uh, I think if you guys uh, listen between the lines, is that the definitive prosthesis is a copy, a 100% a, a occlusal copy of the provisional mm -hmm. under that assumption and the patient has mm -hmm. been using this provisional for a long time mm -hmm. yes i think there's nothing wrong with cementing the crowns in, in one go yeah but if if, if, the, if the lab is not going to copy your provisional and then the lab is going to give you a new occlusal scheme then that's that's an issue mm -hmm. uh, altogether mm -hmm. in, in itself mm -hmm. i guess that could be another topic for another day yes. of, of uh, laboratory management um, so for now, yes, let's go on to the to the topic of OVD because you know although OVD is not really occlusion, but a lot of the cases that we have to manage, whether it's warm dentition or 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 or, or simply there's just not enough restorative space, you've got to change often increase the OVD. So I think we do have to talk about OVD a little bit. Uh, here, especially, you know, how are we going to reorganize or recreate that occlusal scheme once you finish increasing your occlusal vertical dimension. So Johnson, um, could you take us through why perhaps we need to open up the OVD from time to time? Yep. So the number one reason for increasing OVD would be increased restorative space for localizer where in in an aesthetic area, you could use a uh, crown lengthening and uh, plus or minus uh, elective endodontic treatment to gain your restorative space. Or in localized interior where you could use some orthodontic extrusion to increase your restorative space, but for generalized wear uh, by increasing the OVD and then to achieve that um, increasing restorative space in a more additive approach is the more conservative for the tooth. The number two would be uh, to increase the, uh, the interior teeth length as the tooth wears down. The patient complain was the teeth gets a little bit shorter and he wants the teeth back to what they were before. 
And number three would be increasing the occlusal relationship by increasing the OVD. We can uh, improve the pseudo uh, class three or very mild uh, class three into a more class uh, one uh, setting. In this case, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, have you increased the OVD in 100% uh, reverse uh, uh, overbite cases? This case was referred by the orthodontist, is a five-year-old uh, patient, where he is planning to develop the upper maxilla. So I'm um, simply uh, just a very uh, small part in increasing the OVD in this case. Uh, so basically, when the patient bite together, the mandibular incisor is not locking the growth of the maxilla. Well, it's quite a, quite a remarkable that normally I think the orthodontist would just put a blob of composite and, that, that, and, and that's it, right? Off, off you go, jump the bite. Uh, I think even that's a little too much blob of composite for the orthodontist. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's about, what, 10, 10, 10 mil? Yeah, something like that. That's, that's yeah. quite remarkable. Yeah. So there, there's always um, concerns whenever you increase um, OVD. Yes. Is there any safe limits, any, any literature on that to guide us or about what is the safe limit to do? Um, the self limit, I mean, from, from the literature, it will be about uh, more like uh, two to five millimeters from, from the literature. But of course, doesn't mean that we can't increase uh, more than that because, uh, I mean, there are, there are different philosophies. But I mean, in my early days, I mean, I'm more focused on how much I'm increasing. Mm. But nowadays, I'm uh, speaking to the right, right patient, picking the right cases, making sure they have the right expectation, making sure they have the right neuroplasticity. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So working on the brain rather than the bite. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, traditionally, we believe this uh, OVD is, uh, is fixed, just like um, what Egan um, was saying regarding occlusion. But I mean, now we know, regardless of uh, the screw of thought that you believe, once you increase to the so-called ideal OVD, for the wound dentition, you still need to give them a, a occlusal splint or for slit apnea, a, a, a two-piece occlusal splint. So what is your ideal, the OVD just you restore or the one after the occlusal splint? And hence, uh, nowadays, I mean, we believe it's a more, um, more range and then we can you know, work. There are a number of things that we want to ensure that patient can adapt to the new increase in OVD. Ben was asking how much OVD uh, can you increase? Uh, literature say it's uh, safely to uh, increase uh, less than five millimeters. But of course, uh, experience based, uh, you can increase uh, more than um, more than uh, six millimeters. But you have to uh, pick uh, the right patient. The two biggest concerns regarding increasing OVD would be um, some are TMJ joint pain, but most commonly, most commonly masticatory muscle pain. It's no difference to, you know, when you put a restoration that is a little bit high. I mean, patient gets a complaint that is a bit sore and then say, oh yeah, yeah, the, the bite has changed. But when you review them, basically the, the feeling of place is still in high, con in high contact, but basically their, their muscle has uh, got used to the, the high contact. And secondly, it would be uh, phonetics. But the literature shows that uh, most of the symptoms, if you increase within that five millimeters uh, range, that this is only very transient and would usually resolve uh, in a couple of weeks. Well, while that is true for the masticatory muscle pain, uh, the phonetics to take a little bit longer usually could take up to uh, three months for uh, some patients. And then uh, Dr. Ben Lee, uh, there are different ways to increase in um, uh, management of the wound teeth. One option is to not increase in OVD. And Dr. Ben Lee will take us through this case. I think whenever we're talking about increasing uh, or potentially um, uh, uh, managing a patient with a wound dentition, because they're the one that often needs an OVD uh, increase, is that we have to. Um, carry out a very good uh, assessment uh, of the case and present to the patient a variety of treatment options. But needless which option we go to, I think it's safe to say that um, we always want to minimize that increase in OVD wherever possible. And perhaps you could even do it in a fashion that you did not even increase or change the occlusal vertical dimension. Um, so here's a, a case where uh, you can see that there is uh, some anterior localized wear. Um, 
intraorally, you could see that the predominant amount of uh, attrition and erosion is uh, is localized or restricted to the uh, to the to the maxillary anterior uh, palatal region, where most of the posterior dentition had very minimal um, uh, erosion or wear. So, of course, then that means from a restorative standpoint, in able to protect those teeth that are already um, uh, eroded or worn, um, is only to treat those units. Uh, in this case, two to two, one two to two twenty two. There's no need really to restore the posterior dentition. So how do we go about doing that? Well, one potential option is to um, do it orthodontically first in attempt to intrude these affected teeth only at, while maintaining the patient's vertical dimension. And then once you have enough restorative space, then you can restore those teeth. So the patient was quite happy with that proposal, although that this treatment is now gonna take longer potentially because now he has to have that first phase of orthodontic treatment. So through digital treatment planning, we have um, we now have visual confirmation that we have intruded, uh, or attempt anyway, to intrude a one, two, to two, two, uh, upwards. So we now got enough vertical space. In addition to vertical restorative space, we also made sure that there is sufficient um, palatal uh, restorative space. So you could see that, um, that, that we made sure that there is a it's almost like an open bite, but that is eventually going to be the thickness of our restorative material without, in other words, without the need to carry out any more tooth reduction unnecessarily. So once the teeth are straightened up, all we had to do was just to touch up the, the margins, circumferential margins, and roll over that margin incisally uh, to cover the incisal third only, I said minimize tooth reduction. The final restorations are made of lithium desilicate, in other words, Emax. So essentially, it's a palatal veneer um, with, uh, with, a, with a buckle uh, incisal third coverage where they, it's extremely thin to take on the natural tooth color, i.e. chameleon effect to blend in with the rest of his dentition. And then using resin cement to just blob it on, and 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 you know that that looks very very reasonable. So the restorative management cannot be any more simpler. Um, but the 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 total treatment plan and the and to get the patient to that stage that took uh, over a year, um, and the, in the the entire team of course worked really hard achieving that. Whether it's the orthodontist, the the ceramist, and it just made my job look better than than it is. But ultimately we've did not change the patient's occlusal vertical dimension and we've minimized the number of restorative units which is what i think made the case um, good in in general and then there are other cases sometimes either the patient would say well um, i don't want to go through that orthodontic phase or sometimes it's not feasible to do so um, so so johnson is going to uh, show us quite a number of uh, cases um, starting from only working in one segment yep. and another case looking at management of one arch yep. and then finally a case looking at managing both arches so now we're stepping up the difficulty yes. but we're starting with minimal or no management first yeah thank you johnson thank you ben uh, that's a beautiful case so the the first one is uh, uh increasing ovd in one segment only this patient is complaining of um his teeth is uh, getting shorter, so he only affecting uh, one, three, two, two, three only, and then he wants to uh, the length of these teeth in increased. One of the way to um, increase OVD is uh, in uh, fixed prothodontic dri driven cases, is um, the the length of uh, based judge on the length of uh, his uh, front teeth, to how high does it he want to be? The average will be about ten and a half. Um, millimeters for upper incisors. So basically uh, it's an aesthetic driven. So in this case, then, I mean, you, you accept that the resting vertical dimension will reestablish. You accept freeway space will reestablish. You accept phonetics will reestablish. After increasing in OVD, you purely go for the anterior aesthetics driven approach. And 
basically what I did in this case is, is in this uh, localized interior segment is uh, what we call a DAO concept. I build up the interior teeth based on the interior aesthetic need of the patient. It's very important to ensure the teeth 1, 3 to 2, 3 are in good contact. It's very important to let the patient know that the posterior teeth will be in open bite. The way I let the patient know is usually during the first consultation. I do a little bit of mock-up, of a composite mock-up on one, three, two, two, three, and then to let the patient know, and the patient, oh, yes, I do understand the posterior teeth will be uh, not in contact, but I do like the appearance of these teeth. But should the patient say, oh, well, that feels ridiculous, then um, unfortunately they are not the right patient. So you have to be a very clear communication process. So once the posterior teeth are in, uh, in open contact, I mean the safety distance for this uh, localized uh, um, anterior wear, uh, I would say it'd be about two millimeter. If you, the posterior open bite is about five millimeter, it's a little bit um, uh, challenging for the posterior teeth to over erupt. So this works on the philosophy that uh, due to where the anterior teeth have over erupted and hence by building up the anterior teeth, hopefully the posterior teeth will over erupt as well. Um, uh, we have a little bit more information. We've covered this uh, DAO concept more extensively in our previous uh, wound dentition uh, lectures, which can be viewed on the SPG website. After six months, the uh, posterior teeth uh, erupt in, um, in position. Uh, it is very important, uh, as uh, Ben has mentioned previously, the provisional um, restoration will, uh, will be the blueprint for the definitive uh, restoration. I like to leave it for at least one month. And in this case, this was uh, left on for uh, six months. And what I can see is a chipping of the canines bilaterally. Regarding the length of the canines, I mean, in a more elderly patient, I always seek the permission to reduce the length of the canine from the get-go. But for the young patient, this patient was in the 20s, I always uh, increase the length of the canines to what is so-called ideal. But I do let the patient know clearly that uh, his bite or his pair function will determine the length of the canines. And in this case, he's, uh, he obviously have a significant pair function, so that is even though he, he's trying to control it, but uh, no. Because normally with COMSA it's a more gradual way, but when the dental pair function, when the force is significant, they will result in a chipping of the canines. And then this is uh, the, the final restoration. You would have uh, noticed that in the uh, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, it's a more layered Emax. In the canines, I've shortened the, the canines, but I've also used a more monolithic uh, material to reduce the risk of uh, porcelain chipping. The canine was in uh, canine guidance before, but um, because he was chipping as uh, uh, reducing the, the length of the canine, now we have more teeth to share the load. I mean, could I have shortened his uh, canine a bit more to allow more posterior teeth in contact? Well, no, the patient said no. In a more uh, elderly patient, uh, potentially, uh, yes. But ultimately, uh, the protection of these teeth is uh, with the occlusal splint rather than the occlusal design or the material design. The, the, the third case is where I'm encroaching uh, OVD, but in a single arch only. Uh, this is a case of uh, dental erosion, uh, mainly, and then it's affecting the teeth 1, 5, 2, 2, 5, and also uh, 3, 6, and 4, 6 as well. Erosion is very different to uh, uh, dental attrition. Dental attrition is a lot of forces, a lot of breakages, whereas the, um, for uh, dental erosion, Basically, uh, the loading is uh, much reduced. So in this case, I works up the uh, uh, I articulate the the model. The way I do my OVD increase is uh, the same restorative driven. I get the anterior teeth to the right length uh, that the patient approve aesthetically. I usually like to do a mock up so I can determine the patient aesthetic uh, demands, but also. Uh, let them know there will be an increase in thickness of the resorted material as well. And then I take my occlusal record at that appointment at the right increase OVD with anterior contact using the composite mock-up. 
and then I wakes up the case. Traditional in the process training, we were told to uh, take the record and then we open or reduce the pin on the uh, articulator. But I do find, although uh, for most people we do have uh, 200 microns of that error, but if it's, it is in gold, if it's in composite, then it's easy to adjust. But if it's in gold or zirconia, then you could be taking a very long time and that could compromise the material as well, in particular uh, zirconia when you have to cut a lot. So I do find when I increase my OVD, I like to take my OVD in the predetermined occlusal vertical dimension. And I work exactly to that occlusal vertical dimension to reduce the need for occlusal adjustment. In this case, this is a, a direct composite build up for the patient. Patient was in the early 20s. We have discussed options of using a, a ceramic material of um, more or less like um, ceramic veneers in the interior and then just partial coverage for the posterior. But the patient decided to do go for the composite as a more medium uh, term outcome. And um, this is the, the occlusion. If we look at the, the canines, the canine for the dental erosion case would be a lot longer or the normal length compared to dental attrition cases. And then going to uh, how Agnes was talking about um, Baron's concept of having just one uh, tooth contact uh, per tooth. And as we can see, uh, the posterior teeth, some are more um, lingually, uh, palatally tilted than the other. And some are a little bit <laughs> tilted uh, buckly as well. So some will have one or uh, uh, two contact, but this is what we call the therapeutic uh, occlusion. And I've also restored uh, four, six and three, six. Some have more uh, tooth contact depending on the inclination of the um, maxillary or mandibular teeth. So this is definitely different to a uh, more ideal occlusion where you, people go through orthodontics you're trying to get you know, th more or less three or four contacts per tooth. Therapeutic, you can, it could be one, it could be two, or it could be three, depending on the patient's occlusion, basically, mm. yeah. For your end, uh, for the previous uh, case with, uh, with a doll concept, yes. uh, one, one question here asks, do you always find that teeth passively rub evenly? Uh, well, well, it is unpredictable, but mm. then, they do erupt relatively, relatively, even, evenly, uh, relatively. That's what I will say too. Yeah, yeah. It's another very, very good question, which is you often with dull concept, we, 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 we build up the anteriors. Have you ever done a case which is for the, for the mandibular anterior, but using the dull approach? I personally haven't. I, I, I personally haven't as well, because people complain about uh, aesthetics of the upper teeth. Yes. And then the dull concept is usually we treat in the 20s, 30s, 40 years of age. I mean, I've treated in 70s yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. But usually they complain they don't have sufficient amount of maxillary tooth. Maxillary right. tooth. Yes. Right? And they really complain about the mandibular because but they, in don't, theory, they don't show up. Let's, let's, let's assume it's, yes. it is the most amount of wear is yes. down there. Would you consider doing that? Uh, definitely. So mm -hmm. we can do a maxillary only combination, maxillary and mandibular. Mm. But in theory, mm -hmm. you can do mandibular. Not that I've done one, but mm. in theory, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because quite often, we, we, whenever there's a lot of mandibular wear, there's also a lot of maxillary wear. Yes. So often, yes. It's, it's for dual, dual arch, you will add a little bit on top, a little bit on the bottom. Correct. That's, that, Correct. that's the most common. So it's not so common. But hypothetically, there could be one, three to two, three may have had a porcelain bridge Correct. for a Correct. long, long time. And Correct. that, that, that ceramic may have exacerbated the wear of yes. the mandibular dentition. But that, that bridge has held up quite well. Correct. But, Correct. but not so much the mandibular teeth. But you told it right. I do have a patient with a patient have uh, wear where uh, seen another dentist to get a one three two two three done, and then now the wear is even worse on the bottom. Oh dear! But, but that patient decided for uh, orthodontic mm. intrusion. <laughs> I think for that particular question, um, it, it, I I've done cases where it's both um, one three two two three as well as three three two four three, like you say, combination. Mm. Mm. Not um, not just the mandibular teeth standalone, but I think for to answer that question more uh, comprehensively, it is, I find um, noticing the distance between the molars uh, in terms of the degree of opening uh, to anticipate the dull um, 
concept to to work or to observe um, it's being I, I do believe that you do not over open so the the opening uh, at the posterior teeth that you observe for this passive eruption on to occur is no more than um, two millimeter mm, mm. often um, the opening uh, the degree of opening in the uh, posterior area is only by about a millimeter, mm. a millimeter, or millimeter and a half. Then we can expect this uh, adaptation and, and passive eruption. Mm. Um, but we're not talking about over opening at the back and mm. think that the teeth will come together. Um, yeah, so it, it is more looking at that space rather than thinking which teeth comes together at the front. Yeah. Especially for bruxes, isn't it? The ones with mm. very thick bony plates, often those teeth do not move very much, yeah. I'm afraid. Or mm. Unless in the patient who's growing, then of course there's a lot of growth yes. potential. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's a different yes. story. Um, to follow up to that question, gosh, we're getting good questions tonight. <laughs> um, have you ever done for posterior? There, we have seen localized posterior only wear, right? We have seen that. Have you ever done a reverse double? Ah that you build up the posteriors only and you allow the anteriors to auto-erupt? Uh, uh, often, uh, often uh, on a CR abraxa, then that's when you see posterior where yes. we haven't managed a lot of that. I mean, a literature that Dao uh, paper described, they could do it for posterior, just yes. do on a single tooth or, yes. or two teeth. I personally haven't done it, no. but, but uh, that could work. I've seen uh, some, uh, um, some patient, they have localized inferior teeth entire way, but they have posterior dial built up to reduce the pressure on the teeth. But right. but this is on the all the four posterior teeth bilaterally. Right. And they build up by about three millimeter, but I see the intrusion by three millimeter. Wow. But so in theory that could work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Intrusion does happen. So yes. yeah. Yes. And I do see them. So in theory that could work, but I haven't done it. So that'll be a combined restorative and orthodontic Big due to the intrusion effect. To, that, to that, erupt. That, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so in for that case, I build up <coughs> the interior and then mm. remove the posterior comps and then mm. orthodontic extrusion mm, again. Mm, mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, of course, uh, after when you, um, if the case becomes more complex, and then you may have to increase the vertical for both arches, isn't it? Yes, yes. Which is which is your, your, your next case. Yes. Mm. So, so in this case, if the tooth wear involves uh, both arches, then you have to uh, restore both arches. The advantage of uh, restoring both arches uh, is you can level the occlusal plane. So the advantage of uh, level the occlusal plane is uh, you have a more even distribution of the forces. And when you do uh, both arches, I mean, you have the advantage of really flatten the cuspal incline as well, which reduces uh, uh, the, the, f uh, uh, the f pressure on the fourth on the tooth. And in this case, we can see the, the canines are significantly, have significantly over erupted as well. So this is a case of generalized, uh, generalized uh, uh, attrition with uh, reduced uh, uh, posterior support. And then where we have uh, uh, over eruption of the, uh, some of the teeth, in particular, the mandibular canines. So, I mean, we could, uh, I mean, we could, uh, increase in one arch in, in theory, but it is always uh, better to increase in uh, both arches. Regarding how I uh, determine uh, OVD for fixed uh, prothodontic cases, I always go for uh, just the uh, how much anterior restore space I need to satisfy the aesthetic uh, demand of the patient. And then the patient will um, Provided we only increase in about two to five millimeters, the patient will um, develop or adapt to a new OVD uh, freeway space and a speaking space. So this is, uh, I basically uh, uh, do a little bit of constant mock-up on the patient and this patient is very, um, uh, I can, I know by talking to the patient that he will adapt to the new OVD world I did a mock-up, I said, wow, most people are, were really hated uh, for the first few days when I increase, increase the bite because I'm basically rebuilding what you have lost gradually in the last 40, uh, 40 years in uh, three hours, uh, could be four hours of uh, composite uh, build-up. And then he said, wow, well, let's get it. Let's get it done. When do we get it done? And even on the day after three hours of, uh, three, three and a half hours of dental work, his jaw is a little bit tight. I said, oh, yeah. All good. Uh, I'm, I'm getting used to it already. So 
I mean, I assess, I mean, giving the patient uh, the right expectation. I give them the, the worst case scenario way. I say them realistically for the first two days. You will feel like picking up my phone if you have my personal mobile number, mm -hmm. you know, just to reduce um, all this uh, concept back to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, you'll feel like the, the teeth are extremely long. It could be look like rabbit teeth, horse's teeth. But I do say after two weeks, most patient uh, wants me to uh, build them up a little bit longer. <laughs> and that's, that, that's when I say no, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I'm giving them the, the best case scenario where they're not going to get used to it. It's a relearning process for the brain. And most of the time, patient to adapt when you stick to within that two to five millimeter range. And then I always do a mock couch so they can feel a very um, rough idea of what it could feel like. And most of the time, all these cases, I don't go for a try-in with a ProTemp or LuxaTemp material because I have communicated with the patient with the aesthetic expectation through mock-up how I'm going to increase the OVD and then I just go to the uh, build-up straight away. So in this case, I've leveled the occlusal plane. I have reduced the, the, um, the length of the canines. The upper uh, canines will be in implants. Uh, ben will cover with us how important it is for the implants not to be in canine guidance to reduce the complication, uh, very important. But patient doesn't want short canines as well. So I've stopped with the, with the patient. I reduced the mandibular canines by one to two millimeters. And I always wait for uh, at least one month for uh, in the provisional. And in this case, patient was going through the implant phase. So I always build up the occlusal vertical dimension before the dental implants. So the longer you have the patient in provisional, the better uh, you can assess how they get used to it. But more importantly, with the wear and tear, you can design the length of your final um, definitive prosthesis. And the, in this case, this is uh, in the definitive uh, prosthesis where we, we copy exactly uh, what the provisional restorations were, but increasing our two arches, we can get a more even occlusal plane and then more better distribution, we can flatten the cuspal angle. Yep. Mm. But of course, uh, there will be a caution as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, not everything is a, is a, is a pretty uh, picture. It's about picking uh, the right patient, working on the brain. Uh, there are some patients with a compromised uh, neuroplasty artistry. Some people could say this could be age, but it's not a good determinant. There could be a, um, a, some, some patients are 90 year old that could used to be driving, still function well. There could be patients in 50s who, who's not really functioning well. But generally, uh, my go-to would be um, if they have a simple restoration, they require a number of adjustments. Uh, or if they've seen another prothodontist, they require something like 10 or uh, 20 visits after uh, increasing uh, OVD uh, by one or two millimeters, they are not the patient to treat or could be uh, medically compromised, but usually some cognitive uh, issues uh, that you have to be very cautious and clear communication is the key. Mm. Secondly, any uh, TMD uh, patients, uh, they need to be uh, stabilized, stabilized first. So it has shown us a, a beautiful case how uh, how my algae was stabilized first before you move in now. I mean, uh, usually uh, we like to do a provisional with a fixed prosthesis. I do think uh, so is a patient tolerant well because I mean, she also put three teeth to the occlusal splint. So suddenly it's not just the occlusal splint, it's the occlusal splint uh, partial denture. And that really increased the, uh, the tolerance uh, significantly. But usually when you try to increase the OVD in the removal of denture, there's that tolerance issue as well. Mm. Vertical maxillary access, I mean, the limit is uh, as long as their uh, lip closes, then that, that, that could be the limit of you increasing the OVD. But of course, it's always uh, 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 better if the, the patient see an orthodontic, uh, orthodontist and could be orthodontic surgery to impact that uh, maxilla to reduce that vertical maxillary excess. But that doesn't mean if they have a VME, you can't increase the uh, occlusal vertical dimension because not all patients will go through orthodontic treatment and orthognathic surgery. 
and then uh, be, beware dodico facial uh, in uh, open bite cases. I mean, of course, I mean, um, if, uh, if they don't have a, a high smile line, they don't mind being uh, uh, long teeth, then of course you can increase the OVD, but it's always uh, very nice to work with the orthodontist uh, or oral surgeon to uh, close that, um, that anterior open bite before increase the, the OVD. Beautiful cases, Johnson. Um, th thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for a lot of the questions that you may have on OVD. There, there, there has been quite a quite a few questions, so do keep them going. But my apologies that I will not be um, taking any questions that's regarding a clinical treatment on uh, on OVD because tonight's webinar is on occlusal management, and uh, on our previous webinar on the management of the worn dentition, we have actually covered um, the clinical aspect of increasing uh, OVD, uh, just purely because of the time constraint uh, on the webinar that we have this evening. It's impossible for me to cover um, the clinical aspect of increasing OVD, which is really management of worn dentition and occlusion. So my, my sincere apologies for that. But going back to, there is one, uh, there is a relevant uh, question, which is for that final case that you've shown where you did both arches, how did you take the occlusal record? As in, how do you take the centric oh. record at that, for that particular case? So for centric, I usually like just like to build up the interior and uh, bottom teeth. Uh, it could be just a two, uh, two central incisors. And then I basically, uh, well, it's based on clinical experience. So you basically do the comps uh, very quickly. So it would take me about uh, five to 10 minutes to build up four teeth. And then uh, I get the patient to see if they can have a look to get their aesthetic approval. And then that would be the right vertical dimension of I want to. And I take an occlusal so record. So chair side it. composite mock-up. Correct. Got it. Correct. Yep. Yep. So the other way would be like Zoe was uh, doing with a Lucia jig. But I do find comps are just getting me the, the right occlusal vertical dimension that works for me. Mm -hmm. It could be a lift gauge, but lift gauge uh, traditionally asks you to protrude, retrude, and clench hard. Yes. But you can simply just use it as a spacer. But using a lift gauge often, or any sort of uh, Lucia jig or any sort of comps builder, you tend to find the butt in different places. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's finding that arc of closure that's yes. experience-based. And also works well in your hands as well. Correct, mm. correct. I find building up works well in my hand because mm. it's a minimal closure adjustment for me from the get-go. It is, and yeah. also takes a lot about the boxes too. Yes. And then so I suppose like um, you, your composite resin is that anterior stop. Correct. Um, yeah. And then do you chin guide them or you just ask them to so like relax and softly close in the habitual arc? And then and they get the stop and then you, you put the MMR material in or how do you get that arc of closure? So uh, I think I, is what they I, might be interested in. Yeah, it, if the patient can guide self, yeah. then that's good, but that is uh, yeah. really the case. Yeah. The least you touch the patient, the more relaxed you are. Right. Any anytime you put your finger over there, right? Mm -hmm. it, they, they, they become uh, tense. But I do find they need a bit of a, a guidance and you do need to check the arc of closure a few times, yeah. yeah. Because in time there's something new, they bite in different places and hence that is the, uh, the thought of uh, the programmer, yeah. And I think um, in this particular case, the, the uh, important note to take is that once Johnson had done the uh, anterior build up, then uh, during those arc of closure, that is the only single point of contact. So there's no other teeth guidance. Mm. So the jaw record really is, um, it, it, it is a, a condylar positioning rec recording um, without any influence of other teeth guidance. Uh, basically, it just come to an anterior stop uh, where his desirable occlusal vertical dimension is. Um, and then what, what's more is basically a, a patient mediated, stress-free type of recording. Um, and but before we actually take the record, it is observed to be reproducible, mm. and that the patient have good coordination of that movement um, and and a repeated stable uh, jaw closure. Mm. That were the main points. Well said. Right. Um, so with Johnson's cases. Um, Obviously, there has been uh, occlusal rearrangement. Mm, mm. Um, some of them you start off with um, canine guidance and mm. later on end up with group functions. So that's been another large topic that mm. we certainly want to cover, mm. uh, which is what they are and when do we use these type mm. of occlusal mm. schemes. Thank you, sure. Zoe. Thanks, Ben.
Um, so there's different occlusal schemes. And um, uh, the main ones that we need to th uh, think about or um, categorize them into, so we have the balance occlusion, um, and I will go a little bit more into details about each one of those occlusal schemes. So balance occlusion is one, and then we have the anterior guided occlusion, which is subdivided into either canine guidance or groove function. And then we have lingualized occlusion. So with balanced occlusion, it is um, it, it's driven from the von Spee's um, uh, theory of in 1890, um, where he, his observation was that um, the movement that required to actually for a person to grind into food is not only determined by the mechanical configuration of the temporomandibular joint, but it's also affected by the occlusal anatomy of the teeth. And they both have to fit harmoniously together. So um, that harmony is a, a, between both uh, condyle and tooth anatomy in, in all uh, excursive movement and in all movement of the mandible. So uh, the definition of balanced occlusion is when you have a bilateral, simultaneous um, anterior and posterior contact of um, the teeth in both centric and eccentric positions. Um, it is, balanced occlusion is actually a denture term and it's not really applies to natural dentition unless if in patients who are really a heavy praxis because they or in the before when the diet has been quite abrasive and um, that has resulted in excessive tooth wear and then you will get some mediotrusive um, contact uh, or interferences of those um, teeth now um, following on, uh, Shola has um, done a, quite a lot of studies, and I think the study started from 1947. And his findings were that there are actually destructive forces associated with balanced contacts. And these destructive forces, um, although um, these balanced contacts were very good for denture stability, um, but with in natural dentition, they found that it might lead to uh, overloading of the TMJ, and there might be some periodontal involvement of the teeth, or it lead to excessive wear. So as a result of that, um, and from his uh, research and, and his study uh, studies, um, he actually replaced the balance occlusion with a unilateral balance occlusion. So it's not by, um, contacting on mediotrusive and lateral trusive is actually only on um, a lateral trusive working side of the mandible. So there you got, you got the term of a groove function. So groove function, it is a direct descendant from the balance occlusal theory. And you get, uh, we, we end up having a simultaneous contact from the canine and um, um, posterior teeth on the working side during mandibular lateral excursion. Uh, it is uh, uh, resulting from um, tooth wear um, and there has been a, a lot of uh, population studies looking into what is more prevalent or common. Is it growth function or is it just um, canine guidance? And, and uh, people who looked into, uh, researchers who looked into studies of Aboriginal Australians' uh, teeth uh, because of the abrasive diet, they found that the majority of them, probably 80% who had actually growth function, mm -hmm. were minority with um, canine guidance, where others who looked into um, European <laughs> teeth and they found that the majority were just canine guidance um, but as diet has evolved and become a bit more softer um, canine guidance is a bit more prevalent than growth function so the thing with the growth function is um, if a patient who's who clench um, or grind they may introduce there's the thought that introduce a greater contralateral joint compression um, if compared with um, canine guidance and here you can see canine guidance where, where on the working side um, or the lateral trusive movement, we only have contact on the canine, on the working canine. That canine tooth um, has a, a favorable um, position in the jaw and um, it has a favorable crown to root ratio. And it's thought to produce the least contralater uh, co uh, contralateral joint compression. Now, uh, Stewart and Sal Salgat, um, 1965, reported that um, although it is thought with a group function and uh, another form of uh, balanced occlusion, they've actually thought that occlusal wear is, or tooth wear is really not a functional aim. We're not aiming to give patient a worn dentition. Um, it is one of nature's unavoidable mistakes. Um, 
And uh, Goldstein looked into periodontal index of teeth that have canine guidance and compared them to one those of uh, uh, growth function. And the findings was um, they have a lower periodontal index um, when it's canine guided occlusion because it's a bit more protected um, as opposed to a growth function occlusion. So here you can see on this uh, image, this is a um, uh, canine, guided, um, canine guided occlusion. So just a few photos to show. Um, this is actually a case that uh, one of uh, Dr. Lee's cases. And I might actually pass it on to Ben to discuss this case. So uh, long story short, this was a case that was referred because after the, refer uh, the referring dentist has restored uh, basically gave the patient a small makeover uh, with some veneers from 1.5 to the 25. The, prob the patient loved the result, but the problem was this veneer on this canine that you can see on this canine guidance keep on coming off. After twice, it's, uh, it came off, the veneer came off uh, with rebonding, re uh, re it came off for the third time. So that's when the referring dentist thought, well, what is going on with my bonding technique? Is there, is there, is there something wrong with the resin bond that I'm using? What is going on? So that's, that's when the, the patient uh, came to the practice. So when I did an assessment, you can see that the patient has canine guidance during a right uh, mandibular excursion. Uh, nothing wrong with that, except of course, that, uh, that area has been overloaded. And of course, the weakest link always breaks when someone something overloads. In this particular case, this was the lithium, the silicate, an excellent, wonderful material. The tooth is robust. However, the resin bond, in 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 in, uh, in, in contrast, is is the weakest link. So that's why that's what's keep on coming off. So I said to the patient, "Well, we've got a couple of choices. Uh, the the easiest part is we just simply shorten the um, uh, shorten the." The, the, the cast tip of the canine, um, uh, then essentially turn into a group function, uh, but then that canine, this canine one three, will be a little bit shorter when compared to the contralateral side. So aesthetically, there could be a little bit of a compromise. And the patient said, "No, I just spent a lot of money on my smile my maker. I'm not going to tolerate a shorter canine." I'm like, All right. Well, then the only other option really. Uh, is is to accept that little bit of odontoplasty of the mandibular canine. You know, we're, we're not into the business of chopping down healthy teeth, but then if you want that to, to, to last and not spending any more money, I think that's the quickest and easiest way of doing things. The patient says, well, that sounds totally perfectly fine to me. So, so that's what I did. And you can see that I reduced the mandibular canine, the fourth three, the distal incisal corner. And then so that during lateral excursion, I've turned this case from a canine guidance case mm -hmm. into group function. And of course, after that, the, the patient never came back again. So, so I think this is just a case to demonstrate uh, when you may want to use canine guidance versus group function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, nice yeah. case. Well, tell us a little bit more about um, lingualized occlusion, because that, that's another occlusal scheme that's being thrown around a bit from time to time. All right, so lingualized occlusion is a, is a denture, is a denture mm. term, um, occlusion, and uh, it was introduced initially by Agassi in 1927 and then modified by Payne in 1941. The idea of lingualized occlusion is came from trying to uh, achieve dentures that are stable, um, have minimal um, lateral intrusive um, sort of interferences. So all the lateral forces, sometimes when you have a, a really anatomic um, denture teeth, there's a lot of lateral forces when the patients actually choose into their dentures. So um, as a nice compromise between a flat occlusion um, uh, denture teeth where there's a, a poor um, chewing movement or um, efficiency um, to a really anatomic where there might be some lateral forces generated. Uh, the lingualized occlusion came into action um, providing that sort of palatal cusp of the maxillary um, teeth always maintaining contact with the um, mandibular dentition in all movements. Um, and because of that cuspal uh, tooth contact, um, the chewing efficiency is actually improved be, um, because it's, uh, it's acting as a like a, 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 um, a grinding or mm. motopressal kind of thing. So yeah. grinding into those um, um, the food balls and, and achieving a high occlusal efficiency. Um, it's also simplified um, the way the teeth are arranged um, and improved dental stability. 
So that was where um, lingual loss inclusion came into action. Another um, scheme is mutually protected or terminology is a mutually protected inclusion. And I think we hear about that a lot in, in all um, dental literature. Um, so the meaning of this or definition of it is when you have uh, the posterior teeth um, contacting, prevent excessive occlusion or contact of anterior teeth and maximum intercuspation. So there's always a, a um, shimstock clearance or some sort of a, um, almost light contact or even out of contact when the posterior teeth in the maximum intercuspation and they um, able to protect the front teeth from damage. Um, and it is an anterior teeth in protrusive and lateral protrusive movement and all excursive movement actually disclose all the posterior dentition. So you're actually protecting the, the posterior teeth from damages, um, from lateral loading and um, helping uh, preserve um, posterior sort of restorations as well. So this is the a term that's called mutually protected occlusion. So here we've got um, an ICP and as you move into um, protrusive, um, uh, as you can see that the incisal has taken on um, the, the, the guidance and the posterior teeth are in disclusion. Um, same with canine guidance there, so um, fully guided by canines, there's no contact of any of the posterior dentition. And this demonstrates that uh, when you have the teeth in uh, central occlusion, the anterior teeth actually have min minor or almost out of contact um, in, um, in, uh, from, from occlusion. Uh, this there de demonstrate uh, group functions where, where the, you have some sort of uh, guidance on the working side. Um, so the harmony in, in that arrangement is all the posterior teeth are in contact, including the canine. Um, and usually there's a, uh, it has to be in harmony with the condylar guidance. So usually patients might have a, a bit more shallow functional angle um, in the condyle arrangement um, that will allow that kind of um, arrangement of the teeth as well. Again, another group function scenario um, that shows contact of the canine and the molars. <clears throat> now, this uh, uh, freedom in centric, so this, w the meaning of that definition is, is uh, and I think Agnes have touched on that early on in the presentation, um, it is a flat area approximately 0.5 to 1 millimeters, and it gives the mandible a freedom to move from centric, uh, slightly anteriorly, anteriorly without any interferences. So it just gives you a freedom of movement. The patient don't feel locked in, um, uh, allows uh, to preserve those restorations. So may uh, arrange or um, like um, uh, the design of, of the restoration in a way that is actually not locking. So it's got a bit more um, free or flatter cuspal inclines, I suppose, so to provide that freedom in centric. Now, this case is, uh, demonstrates um, two occlusal schemes <laughs> on the one patient. Um, I think we, we started with the lingualized occlusion and then we ended up with a balanced Right. with a balanced occlusion depending on the on the restoration so it's a, a brachiofacial as you can see really heavy um, masseters they had a very high expectations of um, of what he wanted so he's an indentulous patient um, and and uh, he felt that his jaws are hopeless he couldn't really um, retain any of the dentures so he came with a bag of few dentures um, in that bag and he said none of them works and my mouth is hopeless give me implants um, that's what I need and uh, of course uh, there is some limitations with the resorption pattern um, so his uh, mandible in particular is severely resorbed there's a high frenal attachment he's got a really large tongue um, and very strong gentleman so there's a, a lot of uh, chewing forces we expect and that, that might destabilize also his uh, mandible. So um, that's the x-ray there and moving on. So the first thing that really need to, to work out before setting up any occlusal scheme is to get really good 
um, basses um, to record those um, themes. So having a, a well extended impression that covers the, all the extensions of the edentulous jaws. Um, and then from that onward, um, we can make a, a process basis. Um, so these uh, have the higher chances of re be being retentive in the, in the mandible or in the maxilla. Um, so I can take on uh, the further stages of recording um, his MMR and the occlusal vertical dimension. Um, so what I've done for him is um, a neutral zone technique. So this is um, on, on the stable uh, process base uh, in the mandible. And, and this is very important in patients who really can't tolerate um, dentures. Um, so it decides on the position and the harmony between the muscle, uh, the forces from the muscle and the forces from the cheek. So you find the exact position where everything is fine and that space generated between um, the, the tongue and, and the cheek that is filled with the teeth later on. So so with the movement and get him to, to move his tongue and, and to talk so we can actually get an idea of his OVD as well using the neutral zone technique. Um, and then from that I can uh, copy the space of um, the viscose. So obviously, the, uh, so sorry, if you don't uh, know the white material, it's just a viscogel material. So I can copy the space of the viscogel material and use that um, to give uh, the, the, the technician um, an indication of where the teeth, the lower teeth should go. So there we, we moved on to setting up um, uh, his uh, denture teeth and uh, the way those teeth were set up is in lingualized occlusion um, is trying to minimize any lateral forces and, and achieving some even balanced contact. So moving on to the definitive procedure, so that's his dentures, and he was pretty happy with the, the aesthetics. Uh, he could uh, retain his maxillary denture quite well, um, but he always wanted the implants. So there where we in the mandible to help him stabilize his lower denture, and I don't blame him for that, having such a compromised uh, mandibular jaw um, anatomy, like a re resorption was quite extensive for him. Um, so what we moved on there is um, uh, accepting that a maxillary denture is uh, a satisfactory appliance that he's happy to cope with and he is able to retain it well. But for the mandible, um, we uh, planned him for a, um, uh, an implant supported uh, prosthesis. Um, so Following the placement of the implant, uh, there was a, a, a really good um, um, uh, talk uh, initially, so um, made a immediate uh, mandibular implant supported <coughs> prosthesis. And then um, you again do all the stages that's required after the healing or osseo integration of the implant to um, s finalize or, or design a, a new prosthesis. So there, um, you can see in that arrangement, um, there was a, a, a shallow. Um, so with the implant supported prosthesis, the issue was, is it going to destabilize his um, maxillary denture that he's already happy with? Um, that's quite retentive. Now we've got a really stable uh, mandibular prosthesis. Is that gonna cause an issue? Um, so the, the occlusal setup there that um, we went for is a balanced occlusion um, where there's a really shallow uh, incisal uh, shallow canine guidance. So there's a, a contact um, in all excursive movement to stabilize his uh, occlusal setup. Um, and that's the, the, final, the final outcome there, um, where he was quite happy. So there's a, a, a kind of a, a shortened um, extension because of the heavy muscular uh, forces that this man can generate. Um, I decided to keep the cantilevers as small as possible. Um, and uh, uh, give him a shallow guidance in all angle in that occlusal design. What a beautiful case. There's a, there's a, there's a great question um, about what is the ideal occlusal scheme? Let's assume it's a fully dentate case. It's not implants, not dentures. Right? It's a fully dentate case. Is there a recommended end occlusal scheme? Should it be canine guidance or should it be group function? Or maybe another way of asking questions, when would you consider using canine guidance as opposed to group function? 
Um, so the, the ideal occlusal skin, the way I look at it, is uh, definitely having a mutually protected occlusion. Mm -hmm. So you, you're trying to achieve um, a heavy posterior occlusion, uh, slightly lighter anterior occlusion, so you're protecting the anterior teeth. Um, if you remember, um, anterior teeth are more sensitive to really low uh, forces. Yes. Um, so one newton of force, um, it, it triggers the periodontal mechanoreceptor to send the signals mm -hmm. to the brain stems. And, um, but they, they, even though they're sensitive to low forces, they really um, reshard their limit quite early on. So yes. we need to protect them um, uh, where the posterior teeth have higher sensitivity uh, to forces, so four newtons of force, um, and then they last for a prolonged period of time. Um, with the mutually protected occlusion, you protecting the front, but also um, disclosing all the posterior. So there's no interferences um, posteriorly. And I found yeah. posterior interferences, this is the, what causes um, te restorations to fracture and mm. uh, teeth to crack. Johnson, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I agree with Zoe. It's more important to have a mutually protected occlusion, regardless whether it's canine guidance or good function. Mm. But from complication management, I mean, if it's a dental erosion, there's not a lot of occlusal forces. No. I always go for canine guidance. Yes. If there's attrition cases, I mean, most are bruxes are retrotrusive. For sure. Some are protrusive. Mm. Very rarely are they CR. True. So most of the complication is going to be in canine. Whenever I can, mm. I prefer to shorten the canines. Mm. Into good yeah. function. Yeah. Mm. I agree. Anything to add on that? Um, no, it's very well covered, but I think um, also before you choose to have a canine guidance, you've got to consider what canines have you got? Like, you know, what, what is the prognosis of that canine? Um, or if that canine is still a natural tooth, or if it is a, any form of replacement tooth. So um, you, you have to balance those thoughts with the, the this is when you go back to structure mm. and you give, give those considerations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Now, as the night is moving on, we're almost running out of time. So I will speed the next uh, section up just a, a little notch. So I just want to cover a little bit on implants because implants are a little bit different to teeth. So often it requires another school of thought in terms of the occlusal scheme. We know that uh, dental implants are an osseal uh, integrator, i.e. an ankylosed object. And most of the studies will show that there's vertical displacement of natural dentition of somewhere around, say, two to 300 microns. Whereas with implants, um, Ismail showed that the average vertical displacement is only two to three microns. And in other words, that's one hundredths of how much the teeth may move vertically. That's assuming that's a successfully osseal integrated implant. So, Teeth don't, implants don't move very much. Now, the problem here is when there is parafunction uh, that's thrown uh, into this bag, and particularly when if um, the parafunction is unmanaged or there is some other um, poor planning involved, we can see there's a plethora of different types of fractures, whether it's mechanical, um, uh, uh, prosthesis-based, or implant-based type of failures. So um, Sheridan has published a very good review article on the recommended implant occlusal scheme. Starting from mutual protective occlusion, I think we spoke plenty about that, um, so I won't go into details any further, so there's not too much differences with the dental uh, situation. So take this case here, for example, um, we've uh, replaced the patient's uh, tooth number one, two, uh, using a, a, a dental implant. And during um, protrusion, we could see that there is uh, a disclusion of the posterior segment. And during lateral ex uh, excursion, this is primarily canine guidance. And again, this disclusion of the posterior segment. There's certainly no contact onto that implant. Now, the only exception to that, as in the time that you don't want canine guidance, uh, in my opinion, is whenever you are replacing that canine with a single implant prosthesis. This is the case where the patient has lost the canine because of external cervical resorption. And um, you could see that during lateral excursion, uh, there is definitely no contact onto that canine. So there's a shimstock clearance during lateral excursion. Um, in other words, that canine was a little bit shorter 
than the contralateral canine. And unfortunately, the same thing happened to the contralateral uh, lateral canine a couple of years later, where once again, we replaced that tooth with an implant crown. I know you can't really see it from this picture, but you just have to take my word for it. There's definitely no contact onto that canine during lateral excursion. Um, in terms of how heavy that you want your implant prosthesis, once again, because that implant prosthesis do not move very much vertically, uh, therefore it's recommended to have an occlusal clearance during maximum intercuspation. Typically, what that means clinically is you want to achieve shimstock clearance, as in your implant prosthesis is slightly shorter than your neighboring dentition. This is one of Johnson's cases. You could see that uh, the tooth on the uh, the prosthesis on the left it's a, it's a it's a crown on a patient's natural dentition, whereas the right. prosthesis on the right sorry did I say right just then my my apologies the right the right <coughs> incisor is tooth yeah supported. so the one one is a tooth supported crown and the the two one is the implant uh, supported crown, and when ever, when the patient is biting firmly and Johnson is tugging onto the shimstock paper and you could see that there is contact on the, the two supporter crown whereas the shimstock is still quite loose on the implant supporter crown and of course if the uh, if you could get away with the anterior open bite as in the previous tooth was an anterior open bite there's no you could certainly feel free to respect that there's no need to uh, to to make it any harder for yourself but often for the posterior um, uh, units, there, there may be some occlusal adjustment often is required. So you could see that, that uh, implant crown in the center where that cusp is taking a little bit of uh, too much load. So where I, I removed that and uh, gave that a good polish. And so that's the final occlusal form where there is uh, very little contact uh, on the implant prosthesis. During lateral excursion, uh, you also don't want your implant prosthesis to be on uh, with working or none working contacts. So take that uh, implant molar, that 46, uh, whether it's incentric, whether it's during lateral excursion, there is no contact uh, there. Zoe spoke of um, freedom in, in centric or the long centric. So this has um, got to do with the cusp angle. So the implant prosthesis on the, on the picture on the left is showing one with a steep cusp uh, inclination. Well, that is not quite favorable because Weinberg has um, produced an excellent paper which showed that just by increasing uh, the cusp or inclination by only 10 degrees, which is not much at all, but you, the, you can increase the bending moment by up to 30%. So that's why your cusp or incline could make a significant difference to the loading of the prosthesis or the implant. Take this case here, for example, we really have to respect how flat the neighboring dentition are. And they are flat for a reason because this is a severe bruxa. So there's no need to, for, the, uh, for the technician to build up a very sharp looking cusp tip. Looking at it from the, in, the, the lingual aspect of this crown, you could now truly see how shallow the cuspal inclines really are. Last but not the least, occlusal table. Monberg and colleague have shown that just by narrowing the occlusal table, so what they mean by that is if you are reducing your, say, your, especially your molar uh, implant prosthesis, uh, in terms of the buccal lingual or the buccal palatal dimension to roughly a premolar width. Um, reduced by 30%, you can reduce the magnitude of the lateral force by almost 50%, and that is very, very significant. This is a implant that I placed for a referring dentist. Now, before this implant, there was another implant that were there once upon a time with an implant crown. Unfortunately, we've lost that purely because of daytime parafunction. Um, this is a dentist, of course, he's very conscientious. He wears his occlusal splint daily. The, occlusal, um, was, uh, the occlusion was adjusted by myself and maintained on an annual basis. So I know that from an occlusal standpoint, I've done everything I could, but the implant crown width was reasonably wide. I thought I could get away with it, 
but unfortunately that implant failed purely due to parafunction. So this is the second time round now, now that I'm redesigning that implant crown. So once again, I could stick to the traditional size of a lower molar, or I could attempt to reduce that occlusal table by approximately 30%, which is indicated by the red outline. And I thought, well, why repeat the failure? And let's learn from our previous mistakes. And that's why the final implant crown is approximately in a premolar buccal lingual dimension. And further to that, the cusp tip has been rolled in further closer towards the incisal level. So this is quite a narrow molar crown, and that's the finished product. And fortunately, and uh, that is still there inside the mouth. So that sort of occlusal scheme, you want that to be there year after year because of often these uh, implant processes are opposed by natural dentition. And as we all know that the occlusion is a naturally changing, um, uh, changing thing. So uh, whenever you're getting the patient back for your, 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 whether your six monthly or annual reviews, make sure to look into the implant occlusal scheme and maintain it at that. Um, so once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all your questions this evening. Uh, before we leave, uh, leave you guys, just some final concluding remarks. We'll, we'll start off with Agnes. Mm -hmm. Any, any take home messages for our audience tonight? Um, I think the, the two key message I really want to send through is, um, you know, I, I love the concept of occlusion is always been really fascinating, especially when when there are so many different ideas and application. Um, so do enjoy all of that in terms of um, how to apply design principle or during risk assessment. Um, but don't dwell in um, and and get stuck your head into thinking um, it it is actually any form of diagnostic tool or any reasons for treat, uh, because that that is actually, uh, once you get rid of, let go, let, let, let this go, um, it becomes a lot more fun um, to, to work with these occlusal principles. And, um, and, and uh, further on from that is uh, to take note of the differences um, when you see pre people presenting with different occlusal scheme or occlusal issues that um, as you look for more, you will see more. You will see more that has no issues. You will see more that presents with certain issues. And the difference a lot of the times is um, the time. So whether it's been adapted or whether um, it is not. Um, and if you open your eyes, you will see more beyond than um, just mechanical failure or, or TMD. You will see the physiological presentation uh, such as fremitis or, or uh, why is this patient not having other issues? Maybe because um, there is more physiological movement or other things. Um, just just broaden broaden your views and you will enjoy occlusion a lot more. Absolutely. Yeah. Zoe? Well, uh, I think uh, definitely what I <laughs> said is um, uh, uh, important and also like um, occlusion matters. Um, so yeah. provide the patient with something that will work. So not the ideal, but maybe a functional occlusion that will uh, fit in within um, the uh, like jaws arrangement and, and um, um, condylar arrangement and something that will provide them with minimal interferences, um, design some sort of a mutual protection to preserve um, uh, the dentition and the restorations as well. Absolutely. Um, on, on that topic, there's a question about, you know, on, on, on preservation. Um, if you can just quickly cover for this particular um, uh, audience, if you have a canine that's been restored with already a, a car, a, 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 yeah, a cast post and core, mm. would you have that tooth on canine guidance or would you rather go for group function? <laughs> I, I would rather go for group I, function. I, 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 I will <laughs> share, say so share the load yeah. if possible. I will say so too. How are you, Johnson? Oh. Definitely, definitely I, I would have a good function. Yes. Or, Any particular um, um, concluding remarks? Any take-home messages for our audience tonight? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, the first part of my career, I'm focusing on how to technically do everything to, to the right occlusion. Of course. But, but nowadays, I know it's about, about communication, getting the, the message through, mm -hmm. selecting the right passion rather mm -hmm. than uh, what I do. I mean, of course, I mean, mm -hmm. that is because, I mean, I've done a lot of hard work to ensure I get that nice occlusion. Yes. But now I notice it's only a very small part of it. Yes. Yes. Making sure selecting the right patient, right communication is the key. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I think actually that, that there's a really good pun that just came about. And yeah. 
And that is, um, you know, we, we spoke about how a patient really, the occlusion can adapt and, mm. and people can, can adapt to different yes, things. Yeah. Well, as clinician, I highly encourage people to stay flexible in their <laughs> mind. And, and, and that is a mutually protected uh, relationship between yourself yeah. And, yeah. and your patient. Yeah. So um, having that flexibility in how you apply your occlusal principle. Mm. And that is why um, I highly stress the, the f very, there's a lot of wisdom to take in learning the history of how these occlusal philosophy have developed. Um, because um, so long as uh, you are in the zone and not operating in a border <laughs> manner, um, many of these have uh, their their uh, benefits in different scenario after you have assessed the prognosis, which is a perfect um, uh, question that the uh, one of our audience had asked about, well, what if the canine is already compromised structurally? Uh, would you then do canine guidance? It, you know, the answer is actually quite obvious, uh, and I love it how you have able to let us round off with this beautiful pun. So um, thank you. <laughs> but yeah. if posterior teeth are compromised, then we have <laughs> Can I guidance again, right? That's right. So, yeah, and it it all depends whether they are the the natural teeth, the state of the natural teeth, mm. or are we talking about the prosthesis? But in the end, uh, it is so nice to be able to then conclude to uh, just the the simplicity of Bayron's uh, five yes. principle mm. Mm. because it does not define. He has he was so mm. so wise. Yes, uh, to, it's almost like for for see before time to not limit his <laughs> his <laughs> theories to any number of teeth, to just teeth or prosthesis, yes. to muscle or to like, you know, anything, but just to describe that therapeutic uh, smooth movement of mm. the jaw and, and the ability to function. So I think that that is um, really beautiful. And uh, obviously I'm a fan, but like, you know, that's pretty <laughs> biased. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you guys have stolen everything that I was supposed to say. Um, so, but since I don't have anything too intelligent, um, um, maybe the, uh, my concluding remark maybe um, that the fact that I implants and teeth are just a little bit different, and so the fact that uh, teeth has broke, um, there, there often there's a reason behind that. So look into the reason why the teeth previously failed, and try not to um, uh, uh, copy the reason why the tooth has failed and try to build in additional um, factors in to help out the survival of your implant prosthesis. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, and not just for uh, attending to uh, this webinar this evening, um, but also for referring your patients uh, over the years. We deeply appreciate your referral and trust in us. Um, to receive your CPD certificate, don't forget to scroll down to the bottom of the page and to fill in that additional bit at the end. Um, we look forward to having uh, to seeing you at our next webinar, which will be in next year. Uh, I think we'll be in probably February sometime. We haven't set on the date yet, but watch this space. Um, so if we don't see or talk to any of you, um, wishing you all the very best and please stay safe in this uh, festive season. Good night um, and, and goodbye for now.